that's got shall get them that's not shall lose better have deep pockets if you like those shoes mama may have papa may have but i want a man that's got his own that's got Irish one is quite amazing because it is the dumbest governmental reaction to a banking crisis in the history of the world. So the Irish banks were massively insolvent because of insider fraud. And the Irish government decides that it will have the Irish people guarantee all the debts of the banks. Now, the banks are bankrupt. Bankrupt banks are not supposed to pay all the creditors. That's the deal the creditors made. The creditors said, we're gonna lend you money. We know that it's not federally insured or governmentally insured. We know therefore it's at risk of loss and therefore you're gonna pay us a higher interest rate or yield to protect us against that risk. But if we are proved to be wrong, if we've lent to a bankrupt entity, we will suffer the losses. That's the deal they made. And who were these creditors? In virtually every case, wherever you look in Europe, where you had these frauds and bubbles, the primary lenders, the biggest and the baddest, were the German banks, right? And it's not just the giant German banks, it's the banks owned by the public, by the various German states. So German banks within Germany had this reputation for being very staid and careful, all this muss in Ordnung sein. But outside Germany, it's like girls gone wild. It's German bankers gone wild. They'll loan to anybody the riskiest, craziest things in the world. Girls gone wild. I wanna be on the video. I wanna rock the world. I wanna show my tits on television. Irish government was so insane that it even bailed out what are called subordinated debt. Now, subordinated debt is jargon for, I don't get paid unless everybody else gets repaid first. So I'm taking an ultra big risk. And the neoclassical economic theory said, we want to encourage subordinated debt because we want to serve it, have it serve as risk capital. Because these guys know that they will be wiped out if the bank fails, they will be hyper vigilant in providing what's called private market discipline. So what did the Irish do? Bail out the subordinated debt holders, completely contrary to all logic who were the biggest subordinated debt holders? The biggest banks. And so this bailout of Ireland is because the Irish government created a guarantee which should never have existed under neoclassical economic theory that transformed a banking crisis into a budgetary crisis and a sovereign debt crisis at the Irish level.
crazy parties and such. You can help yourself, but don't take too much. The leading cause of catastrophic bank failures in the United States has always been insider fraud, what we as white collar criminologists refer to as control fraud. This is when the person controlling a seemingly legitimate entity, and for short, I'm gonna call them CEOs, uses the firm as a weapon to defraud. In the financial sphere, the weapon of choice for accounting is accounting. William Black came up with the term control fraud, which is the idea that a company, and quite often it was banks, Black was a bank regulator and found this, discovered this pattern in the savings and loan crisis, that, that the CEOs will use accounting fraud and make their financial statements look better than they are, which allows themselves to pay themselves too much money, and they keep doing this until the company blows up. There's a simple recipe for maximizing the fictional income through accounting fraud. We have a Nobel Prize winning economist, George Akerlof, who wrote way back in 1993 with Paul Romer an article, and the title says it all, looting the economic underworld of bankruptcy for profit. Grow really rapidly, make really bad loans, have extreme leverage, and put aside virtually no loss reserves. Now here's the change since 1993. In 1993, the bank failed. In 2008, the federal government bailed out the bank and left the fraudulent CEO in charge of the bank and changed the accounting rules so that the fraudulent bank with the fraudulent loans could create fraudulent income for which it could pay real compensation in the form of massive bonuses to the CEOs who had destroyed their banks through fraud. We had uh, some lifting of regulation in the 1980s out of a rather naive and unproven belief that uh, you can design a financial a system with the only goal being greater efficiency. Economists have, in all of their financial models, an equilibrium assumption. You know, that sort of simple-minded graph that anybody who's taken economics, any form of economics, where the supply line meets the demand line, and, the price is supposed to wind up there. That in and of itself is an equilibrium assumption. The problem with the financial crisis and um, trying to, to change the way our economy moves on from here is that uh, financial transactions make people really bored. If financial markets have been demonstrated to have no propensity to equilibrium. They're, they're inherently prone to boom-bust cycles. Um, but if you believe that markets have a propensity to e equilibrium, that means you don't have to worry about safety. Conversely, real systems engineers, like computer program designers, architects, believe that the first order design consideration of any system is safety, and efficiency is a second order consideration. Whereas economists basically got it backwards. They figured they could drive for efficiency. They saw deregulation as the vehicle for efficiency. And they did it by compromise. And the result was that they compromised stability.
the concept of too big to fail, or uh, as the administration in the United States and in many other governments wishes to now call them, um, systemically important organizations, like they deserve a gold star, is completely reversed. By their own logic, these banks are important because if a single one of them fails, they're telling us it, there's a grave chance that it will produce a global financial crisis. And so the correct name, and we must start with calling things by their correct names, is that these are systemically dangerous institutions, SDIs. It's sort of like being a suicide bomber. If you walk in and say, I'm going to blow myself up in a, in a crowded subway and extort somebody for money, you can probably get people to pay you a lot of money not to blow yourself up. The banks will argue that they didn't intend to extort, but they managed themselves in such a reckless way that it didn't really matter. They were, they were effectively walking around with bombs on them all the time. It was just a matter that suddenly the timer started going, and that's why people started coughing up the money. Now, here's the good news. There's no reason at all, ever, anywhere in the world for an SDI to exist. They are far, far too large to manage efficiently. In other words, we would improve efficiency if we cut them down in size so that they were perhaps one quarter of their existing size or even less in the cases of a you know, monstrous en entity like Deutsche Bank, for example. Yet, not only has the United States not shrunk the SDIs, the systemically dangerous institutions, it's actually made them much bigger as a result of this crisis because they've acquired other failed SDIs. So we have already too big to fail becoming bigger, bigger than to fail. American society has developed a really bad tendency to celebrate behavior that ought to be criminal. We still lionize people like hedge fund managers and private equity managers, uh, many of whom engaged in very destructive activities. One of the prime examples is John Paulson, who's a, who's a very famous hedge fund manager who bet against subprime mortgages. Now, normally, shorting, even though it's unpopular, is a valuable activity because you give information to the marketplace that something is amiss. But what Paulson and other investors were doing were using collateralized debt obligations, as a, and they were a vehicle that actually hid the fact that they were making short bets. So that the market didn't correct, the market didn't get the information by their activities if they, as it should have. In fact, if the market had been working correctly and the CDOs weren't masking the size of their bets, they would not have been able to take such large bets. They would have made money, but not as much money because the bets would have been smaller. Perversely, the operation of those collateral debt, last debt obligations actually led the subprime market to continue much longer than it would have by distorting price signals, by keeping the market from working correctly, and by creating demand for the very worst mortgages. Housing has been an easy way to determine whether or not we have private wealth. Um, it's been a narrative that has been touted um, for, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and in the beginning, it started with better ideas. It started with the idea that people could work hard in the American way and be able to buy or engage in a 30-year fixed mortgage. That was a decent idea because it's something that um, is set up to create an opportunity for people who um, are in a position to take up that opportunity. That idea has been diluted and changed over time. Um, and, and so those 30-year fixed mortgages have become something else. We have a system in the US. We've gone further down this path than any other country of what they call originate and distribute. In the old days, a bank would make a loan, like a mortgage or a credit card loan or a student loan, and keep it. 
that meant the bank had to be careful because if it made a bad loan, it would be stuck with the losses. Now the system we have is the banks will again find the borrower, negotiate the deal with the borrower, and then will sell the loan, um, and they'll be packaged with a lot of other loans and then sold to investors. That means, frankly, all the bank has to care about is whether it can sell the loan to the next party. It's sort of a hot potato process. As long as I can pass the hot potato to the next guy, it doesn't really matter if the potato is rotten. You say potato, and I say potato. You say tomato, and I say tomato. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing up. You say either, and I say either. You say neither, and I say neither. The United States economy in the last 20 years has been riding one bubble after another. Uh, it's been riding, first of all, rode the tech bubble in the 1990s, and that crashed. Uh, and then it rode the, uh, the housing bubble, and before that there had been a stock market bubble and so forth. Now part of this is a result of neoliberalism. In the United States we haven't had a coherent model of economic growth that was uh, sustainable and uh, socially uh, efficient in the sense of, re of distributing wealth broadly and so forth. So we've had a, an economic model that's been based on uh, riding bubbles and hoping that it'll, it'll trickle down, a little bit will trickle down to the masses and keep them relatively satisfied. It's amazing if you look at the uh, housing bubble in the United States and if you look at the Schiller uh, graph that shows housing prices just uh, going up and up and up and up and at levels that we hadn't ever seen over uh, you know, 100 years or so. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, the question is, why didn't more people shout out and say, uh, this is unsustainable. This is a bubble that's, that's going to crash and it's going to uh, bring the economy down, down with us. If the government was going to bail out somebody, um, the efficient answer in economics and the, of course, fairer answer under any theory of morality would have been to give the money to the distressed working class homeowners who had been defrauded uh, into overpaying uh, for their assets uh, by the lenders. And instead, the lenders were able to compound their initial fraud by driving the working class people into bankruptcy, which in turn made the Great Recession far worse and prevented recovery. Naturally, we wouldn't provide money to the working class people, but we provided money in un historically unprecedented amounts to the largest financial institutions. And bizarrely, we were much more willing to subsidize incredibly wealthy European banks than we were our own people. So the US taxpayers saved Deutsche Bank, they saved all of the major Swiss banks, they saved a number of the uh, Netherlands and uh, French banks and such, and the US people don't even know <laughs> that they've uh, done that, because uh, that would be sort of like cognitive dissonance on the whole free market-ish stuff. You say laughter and I say laughter, you say after and I say after, laughter, laughter, after, after, let's go the whole thing up. I like bananas and you like bananas, you like Havana and I like Havana, banana, banana, Havana, Havana, let's go the whole thing up. So, collectively, what all was done? Collectively, the losses didn't have to be recognized. In fact, they were hidden. That keeps markets from what we call in economics clearing. So the markets know that the prices are artificially large. Why would we invest more in housing when you know housing values are inflated? 
And so housing values have continued to fall in the United States. It also means with the financial subsidies we've given to the banks, it makes more sense for them to, in essence, clip coupons, to simply take the money they get for free, essentially, from the U.S. Federal Reserve and simply buy a bond in another country. And that difference in interest rates, what we call the spread, um, creates a very nice profit at very low risk. But of course, they're not lending to the productive economy. It's got his own. 